Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, that's the plenary uh, lecture that uh, will be presented by uh, Professor Stefan Bordas. It's professor Stefan Bordas is a professor of computational mechanics at the University of Luxembourg, in the Department of uh, uh, Engineer, Faculty of uh, Science. Uh, he, he's a professor that he works in a lot of fields. Uh, the main fields of his uh, uh, research are biomechanics, computational mechanics, data mining, finite element methods, fraction and durability. There are a lot of disciplines about aerospace and aeronautical engineering uh, and civil engineering. Uh, he has authored and co-authored a lot of papers uh, and uh, in particular he has uh, developed methods to reduce the mass generation uh, borders. Uh, also, he has worked on the apostolic error and, uh, and in isometric analysis. Uh, we are ready to, um, to attend uh, Mr. Borda's lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you for introduction and in particular thank you for the invitation and uh, for accommodating the the talk um, in uh, a bit of a of a last minute because of my uh, my own mistakes last year so thank you very much I'm very happy to be here and as you can see from the names on the first slide I uh, have collaborated quite a lot with uh, people from Greece and I would really like to be in in person in Greece at the moment unfortunately if uh, you can see uh, names such as Kostas Agathos, who is now a uh, lecturer in, uh, in the UK, in Exeter. Eleni Shetsi, who is a professor at ETH. Uh, Eleni Koronaki, who is a postdoc in, uh, in our team. Vasilis Krokos, PhD student also in, uh, jointly with Cardiff and uh, the University of Luxembourg. Um, Paris Papavilsiliou, who is uh, now a PhD student working with Eleni uh, and myself and so on so yeah i'm very happy to be actually presenting in greece uh, i've unfortunately never been and uh, the only thing i i know is the uh, the the history and uh, the philosophy that came from your country so i would be really happy to be so now, now let's move to uh, to the talk. So it's going to be about fracture, about fracture across scales, but also across time in a way that I'm trying to do to do a bit of uh, of history of, uh, of fracture mechanics. I mean, at least in a, from a certain perspective. The the work was done in collaboration with many people. I probably forgot a few here, but um, it's also in collaboration with the University of Luxembourg, uh, Cardiff University, and uh, IIT Madras, and many other universities that I've, uh, I could not list. Uh, this is Luxembourg, and this is the the university here. So this is in the south of Luxembourg. I'm saying this because maybe you guys don't know that there is um, much activity in terms of research and development in Luxembourg. But uh, the university is young but dynamic. Uh, we have now 15 or more ERC grants live in the in the place, uh, which means that you know if you look back um, in 2013, there was a, a single ERC grant. Uh, so that means uh, quite a lot of progress if you believe that this is, a, a, let's say, a metric for this. Uh, this is a very dynamic area and uh, I'm speaking now from behind this high furnace, which is uh, still there, conserved. And the idea is to show that uh, the novelty of science in these big and modern looking buildings mingle with uh, the traditional industrial era, which is represented by these high furnaces showing the industrial strength of Luxembourg, which actually made it a, a strong economic power. So um, what are we going to talk about? So I, as was said in the, in the introduction very, very clearly, uh, we've been working on the interface between mechanics and medicine. Um, at the moment in, in our team, there are about 30 people and uh, a lot of them are working in mechanics, I would and about a third of them are applying their work to medicine because we realized that uh, quite using mechanics to understand better what's going on in the human body. 
For example, we are currently working on the brain, and we were yesterday writing a, a paper with um, my PhD student Stéphane Urquin on uh, two fluid force medium can represent the behavior of the brain under load. And um, this work, I think, is quite rich. Uh, so now let's see what happens if you compare mechanics to medicine. In fact, there are quite some quite some commonality. So first of all, if you look in, in, in mechanics, let's say of a huge aircraft like an A380 that you see here at the bottom left, uh, this aircraft is, is made up of um, relatively complicated material, which obviously is also the case in medicine. So there are many different uh, differences between mechanics and of engineering materials and medicine. The first being that when you perform experiments on mechanics uh, of materials, you usually do these experiments in a lab and they are relatively reproducible in the sense that you can take similar pieces of steel or concrete, test them and expect to have a certain spread which you can predict before actually making the experiment. So in medicine things are rather different because first of all you cannot take samples from live patients that would make no sense and on top of that even if you could you would see one person and another which means that this patient specificity makes everything very much more complicated so when we talk about digital twinning of patients and digital twinnings of engineering devices we talk about two things that are relatively different but i will try to make a case that there are some common denominators between the two which allow us to work on methods that could be applied to both cases so first of all, let's look at uh, money because money talks usually. So in medicine, you know, uh, we are talking a lot about vaccines and other, uh, let's say, medical devices, let's call it this way. Uh, so to develop a major pharmaceutical uh, product, uh, costs are about four to 11 billion, uh, let's say dollars to say something. And for the Airbus A380, <clears throat> the development cost of that was about 11 billion and even more for the Dreamliner in, uh, from Boeing. So you see that things are not so different, in fact, when you think about developing a drug or developing a piece of equipment like the Airbus A380. And um, things are also looking similar from other perspectives. For example, if you look at the, uh, the wing of an Airbus and you look at the microstructure or nanostructure, for that matter, of the brain, which we were talking about just before, you see that there are commonalities. For example, you see discontinuities taking place at the interface between the plies, and you also see these discontinuities between the white matter, the gray matter, the axons, the fluid, and so on. So you see that there are some complex, let's say, to, to use a generic word, phenomena taking place in both cases that are all taking place at different scales and also involving different physics, if we assume that we talk about a couple of problems in by saying multi-physics. So that means that when you look at fracture mechanics, you can look at it from a continuum level, meaning that you assume that the material is like a continuum, except for the crack, which induces a discontinuity in the problem. And uh, there are different ways that you can look at, the, at this uh, issue, either linear elastic elasticity, which has well-known difficulties such as singularities at the crack tip. This is, for example, at the top right, a fracture propagating in um, aerospace components simulated by um, the code Morpheo crack in Scenario, which incorporates our error estimates, which allow the simulation of propagating cracks in uh, 3D using XFEM. And at the bottom right, this is the work done by Timon Rapsuk uh, quite a while ago now, on fracture of, uh, of concrete, including rebars, which is a, an extremely complicated problem to solve, uh, which is solved using mesh remeth. So now let's see why, in fact, fracture mechanics is important. So if, if you look back at the problem of flying, which is uh, quite old now, 1903, with the right flyers, well, you, what you see is that uh, it's basically by you know flying for 12 seconds and 120 feet uh, that was Wilbur uh, Wright with his brother Orville and today we've gone a long way um, to, to say the least because um, you could fly for 20,000 years without having any accident so you could you know start on a plane today fly for 20,000 years 
and statistically you wouldn't have any accidents. So the number of accidents has drastically decreased from one accident to for 1 million departures at the moment. And if you look at the uh, fatalities per year, you can also see that this is decreasing relatively fast and often related to human error as opposed to uh, failing components. So this is how the Wright brothers were writing things down. So they were trying things. They were looking at different wing profiles and trying to see which one would work best. They were simply trying a few things, building it, trying again. And by uh, trial and error, they were building something that eventually flew 120 feet. So this is quite remarkable. We continued doing this, doing this for example, by um, realizing that the windows or in the um, in the fuselage should, if possible, not be square or have at least rounded angles such that the fractures propagating or initiating at one of these windows would not propagate through the whole aircraft and create these very fancy convertible aircrafts that uh, were fancy and uh, very trendy. Yet. So uh, basically people are trying to understand things and by doing that, you know, they simply make experiments sometimes real life experiments, unfortunately, uh, but often in the lab. Now that happened also in the green industry with the Liberty ships, which were used in fact to convey uh, for convoys, uh, bringing food from the US to the UK during the second world war. And they were actually usually sunk by U-boats, but when they were not sunk, they could also sink on their own because of the fact that to avoid the U-boats, they were, um, actually navigating closer and closer to the pole. And uh, when you go closer to the pole, the temperature decreases logically, which means that the brittleness of the material increases. The material becomes more brittle. And because of that, fractures can initiate and propagate. Uh, at the beginning uh, of, of times, in fact, we did not realize that having welded structures, which was very fast to do. So women in the US were building these ships using welding in order to support the war effort initiating, propagating, going through the weld and continuing further, meaning that the whole boat would actually split into two. So there, there we, we learned that it was a good idea to have rivets because these rivets would actually stop the crack from propagating all over the whole boat and would complete failure. So we, we learned quite a, quite a lot by examining what happens practically. Um, I will not go through all details, but for example, we also learned that uh, this is a Liberty uh, Bell. And if you if you look at it, yeah, what was done is actually drilling a hole at the crack tip of the of this um, of this crack, which is not necessarily intuitive to you know to people. If you ask a kid what would you do to prevent a crack from propagating, they would probably not tell you to, to dig a hole there. But they there are some. Um, some very nice approaches to reduce the stress concentration and obviously digging a hole, uh, drilling a hole here would decrease the stress concentration by making the crack blunted as opposed to sharp. So uh, I started my PhD with Ran, who is a fracture mechanics person uh, now in Kaust and uh, he developed domain integrals for fracture and so my job was to look at how to use such methods including extended finite elements to look at the fracture of industrial components so we wanted to take just this Boeing E uh, electrical 757 access door introduce fractures in there and try to look at how cracks would propagate and initially that seems like a very simple problem um, except that as you can imagine it's continuity so it's essentially you have two surfaces across which the displacement field becomes discontinuous and using finite element methods this is not so simple to, to deal with especially because at the crack tip of these linear elastic cracks a singularity takes place as well so because you have discontinuities, the mesh must be regenerated at each step. And because you have singularities, this mesh is quite fine in order to resolve the singularities, whichever method you're using to do this. So as a conclusion, people thought of using the extended finite element method, which was developed based on uh, the work of uh, Ivo Babushka and Marcus Melenk on the partition of unity method, and uh, to extend this to discontinuities which Ted Bilicko and Black, Nicholas Mose, and uh, 
in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so we use these approaches to introduce cracks in a certain region. Uh, the only issue we had is that um, uh, that I had, and that's why I, I really didn't like the conclusion of my PhD thesis, uh, was that we needed to know in advance where we're actually going to initiate, which is okay. That's based on the, the design codes of aerospace structures. But on top of that, we needed to guess where it would propagate because we needed all this very refined mesh, which you see on the bottom right in the red circle, to be predetermined before the cracks will propagate. And that's definitely not something that you want to do, industrially speaking, because it would mean that uh, the propagation simulation is actually not so useful because you already know where things are going to propagate. So it would be much better to have an adaptive mesh. So, over 10 years or so, and now the, the work is implemented in a commercial uh, called Morpheo Crack uh, and uh, sold by Senairo in Belgium. And this allows us to propagate cracks in an adaptive way. So what we do is that instead of refining everywhere along the crack faces, and I think this is quite a state of the art today, we uh, compute locally an error estimate, which I cannot go into detail because it would take far too much time, but I refer you to the paper, in particular this one. And um, that error estimate tells us where to refine the mesh and where the mesh is already fine enough or even maybe too coarse, yeah, too fine. And so that we need to do coarsening. So th that allows us to decimate the number of points, so probably one, two to three orders of magnitude fewer points, and therefore by far accelerate the simulation. So this is for homogeneous materials. And we can look at homogeneous materials in various ways. But sometimes in homogeneous materials, you don't have one crack, as is the case in aerospace usually, what we call multi-site fracture, where you have a number of initial cracks uh, initiating and propagating, such as here with a piece of work we did with Soitec, where you have hundreds of cracks, actually 300, in a silicon wafer that are propagating in order to actually take a silicon wafer through the thickness. So you can imagine cutting from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen that the idea is to cut this using some quite advanced thermal processing and pre-implantation of uh, hydrogen ion which weaken the material locally and create these platelets. When you heat up the material, the cracks propagate and link up and make this surface. And our job was to figure out the roughness of the surface because we wanted to minimize this roughness for the silicon wafer to be cut as cleanly as possible. So this was done by Dennis Sutula, our PhD student, and uh, who is now working in the Brain Lab in, uh, in Germany. And the nice part about his work is that we minimized globally the electricity. So that was the goal. And this is also what's done is in phase field modeling that you can see here. Also a review in advances in applied mechanics with uh, uh, Jay Wu and uh, Vin Nguyen, my uh, long-term collaborator where we compare energy minimal fracture using XFEM and energy min minimal fracture using phase fields. And so you can re refer to this paper where we do a, a detailed comparison and also a review of uh, phase field modeling. All, all right, so once you can address multiple cracks and homogeneous materials, the idea would be to then look at real materials which are used in uh, aerospace. So for example, composite materials. So these materials are super useful because they decrease the weight of structures by 20. So you see over a thousand kilometers, the saving is about nine tons of fuel, which is quite a lot. But of course they introduce complexity in the, in the simulation. So if you look at this picture, which comes from the um, PhD thesis of Pierre Kerfreden, who's professor now at, at the Ecole des Mines de Paris. And we worked together in Cardiff for, for many years. If you look at this, you see the number of plies is about 100. So 100 plies, each ply is 125 millimeters, so 125, uh, sorry, 125 micro, which is uh, not so thick. And in each of the plies, of the plies, you have these fibers, carbon fibers or other fibers that are running in different directions. And so obviously, you would like to understand how these materials behave. And if you followed a bit the news, you know that some A380s were subject to fatigue 
So these composites actually fatigue quite a lot. If you will also read the literature on that, there is an enormous amount of work on fatigue of composite materials now coming up, uh, which was completely ignored at the beginning when we were designing these structures. And now people are trying to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, there is an enormous amount of work on that. And, um, and the problem is that uh, we would actually like to understand how these materials behave before we actually test them in, in real life or in the lab so that we can make real predictions. And these are also environmentally active materials in the sense that humidity plays a role on their um, on the volume they take, so they can swell if the if the airplane lands in quite humid regions, for example, like Hong Kong, they not stay on the on the ground for too long because they would actually absorb humidity, and then that would potentially create um, potential failures or difficulties in the in the composite. So we'd like to understand these these things, but if we uh, if we look at the material in in detail, this is one bolted joint. And you can imagine there is not only one bolted joint in such an aircraft. Uh, and th th these are rather huge problems to solve. Because if you take just three plies, then look at one ply, imagine you need 10 elements, maybe an, a good average. Uh, if you are trying to solve this bolted, a quick estimate leads to a number which reaches approximately 2 billion elements. So it means that you need something like 2 billion unknowns, I mean, maybe. Uh, less depending on what element types you use but it doesn't really matter it's a lot basically is the is the answer to the question how many degrees of freedom do you have and that's one bolted joint for one loading case and you have many loading cases and many bolted joints and many types of composites and so the idea is how can you create such simulations because if you were to solve these problems um, directly out of the box that would actually be infeasible, practically speaking. So one possibility is to tackle the problem by domain decomposition, so type of FETI or short sure complement approaches. Uh, this is still the work of Pierre Kaffer during his PhD. And at the time, I believe he used 64 domain to several of these processes. And um, and solve that. So and that was possible for that sort of assembly, and that was already quite difficult. And it was uh, we're talking 2009, so it's not yesterday, but still, uh, 10, 12 years ago, these problems were state of the art. So today we can solve bigger problems, obviously, but we're still not able to take into account the fibers individually in each ply. And maybe we don't want to do that because there are smarter ways, and that's what we're going to talk about now. How can we uh, basically reduce the problem size, but still control the accuracy? Controlling the accuracy is something that in, in my lab I've been very much focused on, because from my PhD onwards, I had this obsession with refining the mesh in the right areas and avoiding to have fine elements where it was not needed, as we said before. I'm going to talk about two, two let's say, classes of methods and try to show a link between the two. And um, by doing this, I will start by a, a type of method which um, is quite well known. And then I will go to another type of method, which is maybe less well known, which is related to algebraic approaches, proper orthogonal decomposition, proper generalized decomposition, machine learning, uh, neural networks, and so on. And so I'll start with the first because it's the most well known and it introduces the topic uh, smoothly. So first of all, if we look at, now this is not an airplane, but this is a, a wind turbine blade, which we worked on with uh, Eleni Shetsi at uh, ETH and uh, other colleagues. And uh, the, the, the question is, okay, you have composites here on the left, on the right, you have complexity as well. How are you going to solve the problem? So I would like to step back a bit and talk about a, a bit of nom nomenclature and so we start with a continuous problem. We assume in all that I'm talking about, it, we always assume continuum mechanics is the proper assumption. So that could be wrong, but in, in what we do, we assume this. From there, we write a mathematical model. So set of partial differential equations. Usually we discretize that using usually finite elements, but also may, maybe mesh free methods, perhaps collocation methods, uh, SPH, remesh SPH or 
whatever. Where we look for solution, and we move it down in space to a different problem where we look for the solution in a finite space, usually of polynomial functions, but not necessarily. So now we are we are introducing several errors. The first error is the model error, which links the continuous problem to the mathematical model. So here we are assuming that the model that we choose is the correct model. For example, linear elastic fracture mechanics may not be valid if you have large scale plasticity, but you make an assumption that linear elasticity is valid. So if it's not valid, that would be a model error. If you use a hyper-elastic model for the brain, but unfortunately it's a porous hyper-elastic model with viscosity, your model is also not correct. But often the difficulty is, how do you select the right model based on experiments that you have? And we spend a lot of time these days working on this using Bayesian inference to select the best model. But I'm not talking about this today. The second source of error links the mathematical model to the discrete problem, and that's called the discretization error. And that's what you minimize when you do a posteriori error estimates, when you refine the mesh in areas that you are interested in because the gradients are large and you coarsen it where the, the gradients are small. And you assume that the solution there is not going to evolve very much. Right? So that's what we were talking about for the XFEM case at the beginning for fracture. It is exactly that case. And on top of that, you have numerical error, which links the discrete problem to the numerical solution. And that is due to round off, essentially. So if you use 32 bits or 64 bits, your numerical error will be different. I'm not talking about this today. Now, if you add all these three errors, you see the total error. And this is actually what you see if you compare it to experiments. So you see your numerical simulation to, you compare this to experiments and you see this as a total error. But you don't know how it splits between model error, discretization error, this is one of the of the goals of, of my team is to try to devise new methods which allow us to discriminate between those three different errors. All right, so when we talk about validation, what I talk about validation as is the answer to the question, are we solving the right problem, right? So that would be validation. And are we solving the problem right? Meaning are we solving the problem properly is called ver verification in my jargon at least. So that means that today we will talk about a bit of the tool because we will talk about the selection of the model, but also, uh, but not in detail, and about also how we actually make sure that the model once selected is solved in a certain way, which leads to convergent results where the error is controlled. So let's start with multi-scale methods. Why do we need multi-scale methods? We talked about composites, but, um, steel or aluminum or any polycrystal is a problem which is equally complicated because if you zoom in a material what you can see is that you have a plethora of grains and these grains are all different in terms of their behavior and so if you need to solve this thing it's going to take ages because you have a large number of grains each grain has different properties and they are very small compared to the size of the structure so the idea is to replace this overly complicated model, including maybe millions of these grains, by one partial differential equation with constant coefficients. So obviously this is not the easiest thing to do because you have huge complexity on the top, huge simplicity on the bottom. So uh, impossible to review all the work done on multi-scale methods. This is uh, a field which is at least 30 years old if not more, in terms of its computational development. At least the theory is much older than this because it dates back to Hill, and so I would say it's 70 years old. Uh, but if you, if you read uh, the literature, now you see that there are at least, there is some sort of understanding that the methods can be split into, uh, into three categories. So the first category is called concurrent methods. Uh, concurrent methods are such that the scales of importance meaning the fine scale, is living in the same space as which is outside the region where you see these little grains and the crack propagating here. So both are coupled along an interface using methods that are adequate for this. And you look at both the fine scale and the coarse scale concurrently in the same calculation. That's called concurrent. Okay, 
that can be used to couple vastly different scales, such as molecular dynamics and continuum. And it, it is relatively well uh, understood. The, big, the biggest problem here is that as the fine scale propagates, you need to increase the size of the fine scale. And if possible, you need to also coarsen once the fine scale is done propagating, because you do not need to keep the fine scale everywhere. Similarly to in finite elements, you don't want to keep the finite elements fine where there is no need for this, because the solution is now well behaved. The second method is called semi-concurrent or a hierarchical. And in those methods, what you do is you assume that you have a continuous problem, like this L shape here. And at each integration point, you now replace the integration point by a so-called representative volume element, which is supposed to represent the behavior of the fine scale. So this is uh, something which is very well developed. So what you do is you assume you apply a strain field on the RVE, which gets transformed into Dirichlet displacement conditions on the boundary of the RVE. You compute the stress from the strain increment, and then the tangent, which you pass back to x, which is the point, material point, Gauss point in the finite element at the core scale, and you solve. And this is super expensive to solve, as you can imagine. But the nice point is that as the RVE evolves, so if fractures initiate and propagate inside the RVE, this is taken into account at the core scale as well. And because this is taken into account, what happens is the following. Sigma C is the stress at the macroscopic level. Epsilon C is the strain at the macroscopic level. You start by loading the RVE, therefore load the material point at the core scale. You load until you reach the peak. And when you reach the peak, what happens is that uh, using the jargon of that field, you lose material stability so that the tangent stiffness is not positive definite anymore. And therefore, the partial difference, the, its coefficients become some of one of it becomes ne negative, which leads to the fact that the partial differential equation loses electricity or hyperbolicity, depending if it's if it's uh, quasi-static loading that you're talking about or dynamic. And when that happens, the assumptions that made it possible for you to use an RVE are breaking down. For example, the symmetric uh, boundary conditions the propagation of a crack through the whole RVE, and therefore the RVE does not exist anymore, which makes valid only until you reach the peak. Of course, there are many variants of these methods, especially uh, put together by the, the group of Mark Geers uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in Eindhoven, uh, which I'm not talking about today, but there are alternatives to of these hierarchical methods beyond the peak. So what uh, we decided to do when that happened is that we said, OK, well, now that we have this local um, localization, what we want to do is locally refine, but not the finite elements only, but also the model. So we want to have a criterion to decide which model is the best. So this is why we are here talking about, are we solving the right problem? So that in order to reproduce experimental results, should we assume continuity at the core scale, meaning that we have a continuity? an average behavior of the RVE, or should we instead zoom in and take into account explicitly all the fine grains that are present in the fine scale, meaning we superimpose the microstructure onto the finite elements and we solve the problem. So doing this leads to very nice results, and it has the advantage of having both the advantages of the finite element squared method and also the local advantages of having the full microstructure taken into account simply because now the crack can propagate in its actual world, which is the world of the microstructure. And we don't have this problem of loss of material stability anymore. Of course, the drawback is that you need to take care of a, a dynamic uh, method, which takes quite a lot of coding. And also that to initiate this micro to reload upon the whole history of the problem in order to figure out what are the internal variables in the microstructure when you insert it into the macro structure. So this is a difficult thing. But however, we solve uh, the problem much faster, up to three orders of magnitude. OK, so the results are nice. You can look at them in the paper. I don't want to look at the details because they, there is really not much to discuss here. It's working uh, excellently. The main difficulty is the 
but if you're interested in this, we can we can talk. After the beat here, replace. And remember this because it's going to come up in the next part of the presentation. We replace the fine, sorry, we replace the core scale by the fine representation of the microstructure itself. Okay. So now, um, now the second type of approach is going to be algebraic model order reduction methods. So the idea here is to use pre-computations. And so a, a few students in uh, our team are working on this. I'm going to only show a few of the results, not everything. Um, and I can give you a list of papers afterwards if you would like to take a look, because we tackle the problem in, in very, very different ways. But I would like to introduce the idea. So the idea is you would like to solve a huge problem. Let's imagine this beam is an enormous problem, one billion degree of freedom. Let's say it is the bolted joint, for example. And let's say that you want to solve it for a number of load cases because you don't know in advance what, let's say the client, if you're an engineering company, will tell you. Uh, you don't know the load case, you just know the geometry and you know the um, displacement boundary conditions, but not the loading. And you don't know what the loading will be, but you have one week to prepare computations such that when the client comes with the actual loading, you can give him or her the answer within a few minutes or maybe a few seconds. So we're working on that field for brain uh, biomechanics, surgical simulation, and understanding of um, also chemical processes uh, with uh, companies here in Luxembourg, chemical vapor deposition. So we're, we're working on this in, in many different fields, also in wind turbines with Anina Sarkic, uh, who is uh, a Marie Curie fellow here. So we, there are many applications, and now I'm only showing the base, but not the details, because the idea is to understand the concept. The papers are going through all the details. So now, if you look here at, uh, let's assume that you have some time. So let, you have a week to do pre-computation. So you're going to first apply a load, FD1, then a second one, FD2, and every time you will solve the problem and you will store the solution in the displacement field S1, S2, S3, Sn. And then you will put that in the matrix and you do singular value decomposition, which means you extract the, the most important modes, like in model analysis or in principal component analysis, nothing different. So you have a very huge matrix in terms of number of rows and quite small in terms of number of columns and you extract the most energetic modes. If you do that, find three modes, which look like this, and then you look at the shape of those modes. And your question is, how can I use those shapes in order to represent the solution to any arbitrary loading that I've not pre-computed? Otherwise, it would be too easy. Um, so if, let's say, that the customer comes after a week and tells you, OK, this is the load I want. This is FD, and the value is so and so. But let's as assume that this client is difficult and asks you for a huge load, which you have not predicted. If they had asked you for a load that was relatively uh, within the range of what you had applied before, everything would be fine because you would still remain in the elastic limit. But if you are not in the elastic limit and if you have damage taking place, what will happen is that the thing for here is not in the span of the three basis functions that we have here. Simply because, as you can see here, you have just geometrically, you can see it, you have a kink that comes from the fracture, and you have no kink in the three solutions here. Meaning that you have a high, let's say, frequency component that you need to take into account. You would need maybe 20 or 30 modes to be able to figure out what that kink is. And that would not make any sense because you would then lose the, the, the advantage of the method. So the solution is not in the pre computed snapshot and you need to do something about it. So uh, what Pierre Cafferden had the idea of doing now when we were working together in Cardiff is to split the domain into subdomains and then for each subdomain to analyze the reducibility of the problem separately. So to do the C1, C2, C3, domain two, three, four, et cetera. And when the convergence was not, to decide to get rid of the reduction and do a full scale analysis in that region. And that's why I before told you to remember that we were putting the microstructure in the concurrent method to transform from a semi-concurrent to a concurrent method, because here we do exactly the same, except that we are doing that algebraically now instead of doing it from a physics-based principle. 
So the idea is, is very similar. We read except where the residual does not converge. And that allows us to have an adaptive method, which knows where to reduce and doesn't, and doesn't reduce where it's not needed. And so this is, in a way, an adaptive model, because the model is chosen depending on its ability to reproduce the solution locally. So that's the idea. Uh, now let's see um, one more step in that direction using uh, what we call data-driven hyperelastic simulations. And we call it data-driven for a good reason, which I will explain. This is the work of Zahra Deshpande with Jakub Lenkiewicz. And first of all, what do we mean by data-driven? Uh, the um, generation of that uh, idea came in the ITN network rainbow, which is rapid biomechanic simulations for personalized clinical design. So we, there are 15 students working on, on this project at the moment, and they're all working in different areas related to this. And what we want to do is to be able to observe a simulation, a surgical field, and use the observations to drive a simulation in order to help the surgeons see through the brain the target that they need to to target using, for example, needles for deep brain stimulations, or if they need to cut <clears throat> a tumor, they would need to know where the tumor is, but they cannot always use intraoperational MRIs or, or any other medical uh, visualization technique. So it could be helpful to have some sort of virtual reality, like the team of Stéphane Cotin is doing at INRIA in France, where you could see through the brain special glasses, where you can actually see where the tumor is located, and you could actually then navigate in real time to the tumor. But for that, you cannot know in advance the material properties of the brain simply because you have never opened this skull before. This is the first time a neurosurgeon has never done that person, usually. And so you need to actually learn from what you see. So the idea is, let's assume that we have a certain number of deformations of that brain. Can we learn the behavior of the brain by only looking at its deformations and knowing its environment? So that's the basic, the basic part. You can look at the paper at the bottom here for uh, a few details. So the idea is, why do we use neural networks here? We assume, let's say, that we know the force. So that's the big assumption. Uh, I will tell you, uh, yeah, I'll give you that. I use U. So essentially, we want to replace the whole simulations using FEM by neural networks. I mean, and there are many reasons why this is not a good idea. But let's say in that case, let's try to see why it could be a good idea. Um, so I'm not going to, to go through the whole neural network idea. But essentially, what we do is we have a certain number of parameters, we make predictions, and then we compare, we minimize the difference between what we compute and what we observe. And uh, using some gradient descents, we find some minimum. So I mean, this is this is basically the idea. What we do is we use convolutional. Uh, this is work that's um, just on the verge of being submitted, so it's uh, it's really new. It's not uh, yet published, and we use uh, the neural nets because they know the local information and which is exactly the case in finite elements. You have to know the neighboring information because this is what gives your connectivity. And if you don't take that into account in neural networks, unfortunately, the predictions are rather uh, random. So really helpful to do this. So first, what you do is you input a force array. So this is the load on the, on the let's say, the beam. And the output is the displacement. And you're trying to learn the mapping between force and displacement. So in, essentially, you learn the model. Um, to, for, for the moment, we are assuming that we generate ourselves, like in the first case that I showed the snapshots. So here it's not snapshots, but it's similar. So we generate the couples, force, displacement, force, displacement, we apply a force, we solve the hyperelastic problem, we compute the displacement, and then we say the couple F1, U1. Then we do that for N couples, F, N, U, N. And we saw we put this into our uh, our learning algorithm, and um, and we train. Okay, um, let's look at uh, one test example, which would be uh, that one. Sorry, there is a slight bug here in the legend. Um, so we apply now another force which we did not pre-compute, and the idea is to see if we can uh, replicate 
or not the solution. And what we see is that if we use convolution neural nets that know about neighborhoods, we can. If we don't, then it's not possible to be reliable. But now the problem is in biomechanics that we cannot just have predictions which are deterministic and say, okay, the displacement of the tumor is plus two millimeters in the X, Y, and Z direction, because that makes no sense. There is so much uncertainty on the material parameters that we are dealing with. So what we are, what we have done, what uh, Saurabh has done, is to now assign some probability distributions and to work on, on probabilistic neural networks in actually to be precise on Bayesian neural networks so that we can in the end get in, uh, confidence intervals on the behavior of the of the problem. So I'm skipping this and what I am showing at the end is basically if you look at this uh, plot here you see the middle of the force which is horizontally and displacement which is vertically the center of that plot is very certain. It happens to fall within the a range of parameters that we pre-computed. But if we go outside the range of pre-computations, we can now quantify how uncertain we are. So if we make extrapolations, not interpolations, so outside the range of training, then we see that we make quite large errors and that these errors are, of course, increasing the, the further we go, we go from the train region, which is intuitively correct. But here, what the difference is that we can actually quantify that in, a, let's say, in a, in a proper way. Okay, so now final uh, few slides. We would like to do this because in practice, we do not know what material properties are governing the behavior of any organ, right? And not only don't we know that, but also we have very little data. The data that we have is extremely scattered. So if we look at one coefficient of the, let's say, neo hooken model, C C1, for one patient, you would get a certain distribution in the brain that you see here. For another one, you will get a completely different one. So what we want to do is to look at the probability of the target that the surgeon needs to, ta to tackle to be in a certain region. So for this, we need to perform statistical analysis using, let's say, uh, let's call it Monte Carlo to, to make it simple. And so we worked uh, with Paul Ozu uh, and Jack Hale on this, and uh, the results were that we could, in fact, produce a prediction, if we can be so confident as calling this a prediction, that the confidence interval in which the sphere, which is the target, is going to be located, can be predicted at a confidence of 95%, let's say. So I think this is, but the big problem we have and that everybody will keep having for some time is that this C1, the parameter of that is gov governing the brain behavior is unknown. And for that very reason that perhaps the model we're using, the brain, maybe we say it's hyperelastic, but in reality for these loading conditions, it's hyper viscoporoelastic. And we are just neglecting all this and everything is being merged into this number C1, which is incapable of giving a proper phenomenal behavior of this brain. So this is why, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to focus very heavily on the selection of the best model given experimental data using Bayesian analysis. Why Bayesian? Because we have very limited, limited data, so we cannot use frequentist approaches where you, you do averaging, you don't just don't have enough data to do any meaningful average. So this is the idea. And uh, before I conclude, I'd like to uh, let you know that um, I'm taking applications for review papers in a journal I'm meeting with Daniel Belint, which you probably know, Advances in Applied Mechanics. Um, and uh, we are producing state-of-the-art reviews. So for example, facial models, advanced geometry representations that are, so the criterion is that you overview of the field and that you tackle both uh, theoretical and computational approaches but also experimental approaches and show how these three can be linked. So if you think that you have a topic that you would like to propose for this, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And taking papers also for the journal that was created by Mark uh, Girolami at the Alan Turing Institute in Cambridge um, where I, I try to help 
with the, edi the, the editorial process. And the idea there is to work on any topic which is related to data and to engineering, uh, where data is the central point. So uh, I can give you more details if uh, you're interested. And finally, there are many topics I did not cover. So I'm putting here a few of these uh, papers to, to let you uh, take a look at them. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, I hope you have some questions. Thank you. Many thanks for your nice talk and the very interesting uh, subject that you mentioned. Uh, uh, I have a small question. So, uh, from your uh, from your studies and uh, from your uh, experience in all these fields, uh, uh, that I understand is that uh, it depends on the problem how you can uh, manage uh, or you can use a method in order to solve a crack propagation problem. you agree or uh, what's your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, this morning I was uh, editing a, a paper we're going to submit on the material point method with a, a colleague in Finland and he's working on wood fracture and uh, in this case he's using material point method so it's an explicit method with uh, material points that are both ex explicit uh, sorry both lagrangian and eulerian so it's a sort of mixed formulation because he's interested in problems with very large deformation and fraction. so in that case it makes sense now if you want to look at fracture mechanics in homogeneous materials i would definitely not use this method because you need a very small time step yes, yes. and you know fem or xfem can do a good job no, so I completely ag agree with you that uh, there is no nice fits all method for fracture. Actually, it's a very nice topic to work on. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm, I, so there are two questions. For example, for the brain, the paper we're writing now, you, you can take, we, we take experiments in the literature and people have pressed the brain in a confined compression test and they have also indented the brain in an unconfined compression test. So people doing geotechnical engineering will understand what it means and others can imagine that you put the brain in a cylinder, you press on it, and you see the deformation. And in the other case, you put the brain on the table and you push on it without confinement. And uh, then you look at the results and you see, first of all, a lot of scatter. And then you take, okay, let's assume that the model that we have is uh, elasticity can govern this behavior. And then we try to fit. And then we see, okay, it, it fits for strain or up to 5%, but after 5%, it diverges because this model is not able, even the parameters, it is not able to fit the model, uh, the problem, the experiment over the whole range of strain. So this is exactly the right question that you just asked in my opinion, is that you sometimes don't even know what phenomena at play in the deformation so how could we select the model? So this is why we're working on a set of hierarchical model selection where the model part, the part of the model that gets activated can automatically get activated and the one that don't get activated just are left on the side. So I hope it answers the question, but um, because I think that's exactly the right question. Great. Okay, thank you, Stefan, for being with us today, and uh, for even at the last minute, at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really nice, and uh, we got a global view of uh, of your work. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask you, <clears throat> uh, how about the limits of machine learning? We have we have been here about machine learning all the time now for for mechanics problems. Could you specify the limits? Because it is, it is very vague. You know, according to me, the according to me, the, the non uh, 
linear problems is very difficult to be put inside a machine. What is your opinion about that? So first of all, I, I want to say for free PhD thesis, so it, I don't have a very, very deep understanding, to say the least. But my experience working with these PhD students has been the problem related to the fact that extrapolation to me is the problem. So if you do not know, if you do not know what is going to be asked of you, uh, then you cannot approximate it. And my understanding, I cannot do talk about machine learning generally because first of all, I don't know all the methods, but the few that we looked at, which are neural networks in, in the case of these deformation problems. Uh, the, the problem we had is that we, this is a global approximation scheme. It's a bit like a super mesh free method, if you think about it this way. And it's a bit like a huge, and sometimes you're just trying to kill a fly and you don't need this uh, tank uh, to, to do it. And that, some, my intuition at the moment is that sometimes, uh, the, um, depending on the problem you solve, it may be beneficial to simply use finite elements and proper orthogonal decomposition. What I'm really interested in looking at now, because I cannot answer the question that you ask, uh, obviously, as you can already realize, but what I'm interested in is to try to see for localization and damage and so on, if we, no, not if, because we will see the same problems as what we see in proper orthogonal decomposition, which I covered in the talk. And I'd like to see how these methods can maybe be, uh, be more helpful. So the way I see it is that machine learning for me would be very helpful in order to design space with a certain number of parameters and that that number is large then you want to do some sort of um, response surface for the for the problem and that you interpolation within a known parameter space then my sort of uh, superficial knowledge leads me to thinking that this may making could make sense but if you're talking about extrapolating completely outside the range then there is, in my opinion, no magic. So you cannot, you know, guess something that you haven't seen. And uh, so the training set is is the limitation. So that, that is what I would say. But what I like, because it's not only negative, what I like is that you can mix data from experiments and numerical data in one. Uh, that, because for us, we have a lot of experimental data, but very, but we would like to avoid having to simulate because when we simulate, we don't actually know the model itself. So it's like, you know, it, maybe we in, even include some some extra error in it. So yeah, that's a very uh, unconvincing answer, uh, but I, but I cannot do that. But in some <laughs> specific problems, it's fraction propagation. We may use the, a lot of data and uh, we may use machine learning in order to have a, a solution to the problem. What do you think? It's a. Yeah. I mean, perhaps. I mean, the problem with fracture. I mean, we have, we did something with Costas Agassos uh, yes. here, which is somewhere yeah. where we do inverse version, you know, of uh, yes. of fracture. So trying to figure out where where the cracks are given the deformation, which yeah. is a super difficult inverse problem. But okay, uh, the problem is with fracture is that everything depends on the on, on the parameters. So if you change the, you know, as we saw before in the, in the um, in the similar, if you change the angle of the loading, then the crack goes in mode one. Yeah, exactly. So then, if you do an average of zero degree and ninety degrees, yeah, exactly. You will you will not get degrees uh, if you do average of zero and ninety. I mean, you will get a mixture of three cracks, which make no sense physically. And and I think that's what we will see also in machine learning. I don't see why not. In fact, but let's see. Maybe maybe I'm, I hope I'm wrong actually. Okay, uh, huge question, I, and I'm not uh, I'm not uh, an expert in this at all. I, I would say uh, the best is to read the work by Jean-François Remacle, who is the, um, one of the brains behind GMesh, because he has papers recently on uh, 
you know, um, one machine, one minute, three million tetrahedra, I believe it's three and not five. I can't remember exactly, but this paper gives you a very good overview. And uh, I think there are many, many problems. The biggest challenge is to generate meshes of hexahedral element. In my, in my opinion, which can be useful for isogeometric analysis, but also for standard uh, finite elements. That's what I would say. Another question from Dr. Stefano. Can you comment on crack propagation in the vicinity of an inclusion using the XFEM method? Yes, so we solved that problem a long time ago with Sundararajan Natarajan in IIT Madras, uh, who was my first PhD student. And the, what, what we observe is that if we use the J integral method, which is the domain integral uh, method, the domain form of the path independent integral J uh, or its mixed mode equivalents, I1 and I2, let's say in 2D, uh, then uh, we have one about which is to make sure that the domain that we use to extract the J integral or the I1, I2 integrals do not intersect with the uh, inhomogeneity because in that case we have a jump in the strain field and that jump in the strain field leads to a path dependence of the J integral or the I1, I2 integrals because of the fact that the integral is not continuous anymore so when we use the divergence theorem we have one extra term which comes from the jump term at the interface so we can actually compute that term explicitly and take care of that or you can make sure that the that the domain integral associated with the crack tip does not intersect with the uh, with the inclusion and the second thing we remarked is that the mesh size had to be very fine to see anything in fact so I remember being very surprised when solving that problem because in a coarse mesh, the inclusion was not even seen. So the crack would actually go through a, 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 stiff inter, a stiff inclusion, which was contrary to our intuition. And we needed to refine a lot. I can't remember how much, but at least 10 or 20 elements through the inclusion um, to be, be able to get anything meaningful. And that surprised me a lot, actually. Final question. I would like to ask if local HP adaptive methods are well enough to deal with fracture problems. So if you talk about linear elasticity, then I would say, yes, we have now methods that can deal with propagation of cracks with adaptivity that we implemented that work. And so you can even use what we call goal-oriented error estimates and you can minimize the error on the propagation step. And you can minimize the error on the propagation angle. Then if you talk about no, not elastic linear fracture, but things like elastoplasticity, well, I guess the answer is very similar, but the problem is a bit more complex from the sense that you have internal variables and projections to do from one mesh to another. So this complicates the solution process, but apart from that, the ideas are very, very similar. So we definitely i've not done it but i know we could we could do that for uh, large scale plasticity and fracture as well i mean this this does not seem to me a major that there is major theoretical difficulties in in this i mean then the problem is mathematically speaking if you want to have estimates of the a posteriori error estimates you know that are you know really written down and proved analytically that can be done in in very limited cases. You cannot do it in, in, in the general case of fracture. Uh, there are some papers by Erwin Stein and Marcus Rutter, for example, that I think are about 20, 2007, 2008, something like uh, in, in that area. And uh, that prove the, the bounds using residual uh, error estimates. And there are other, other papers also by uh, Ladevez in France at the same time, and by Ham Askes in similar problems and by ourselves, but we did not do the proof until recently where we used the bank visor estimate with uh, Raphael Bull in our team, where we have proofs, but this is not related to fracture, uh, unfortunately. It's a, it's a big thing. Okay, thank, thank you very much for your nice uh, talk and uh, your nice discussion we have. And uh, thank, thank you. you very much for participating in this conference. <laughs> I really appreciated the invitation. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Thank you very much.
thank you and have a, right. have a good rest right. of the day. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.